Hello everyone, this is Saurabh and we are reading Three Kingdoms, Battle of Red Cliff, Chapter 44. Chu Kalyang stirs Chow Yu to actions. Sun Chuan decides to attack Sao Sao. So let's continue reading Chapter 44. The dying message which Lady Wu recalled to Sun Chuan's memory was, for internal matters consult Cheng Chao, for external policy Chao Yu. Therefore, Chao Yu was summoned. But Chao Yu was already on the way. He had been training his naval forces on Poyang Lake when he heard of the approach of Cao Cao's hosts and had started for Chai Sang without loss of time. So, before the messenger ordered to call him could start, he had already arrived. As he and Lu Su were close friends, the latter went to welcome him and told him of all that happened. Have no anxiety, said Chao Yu. I shall be able to decide this, but go quickly and beg Chu Kalyang to come to see me. So Lu Su went to seek out Chu Kalyang. Chao Yu had many other visitors. First came Cheng Chao, Cheng Hong, Ku Yong, and Pu Zhe to represent their faction to find out what might be afoot. They were received and after the exchange of the usual commonplaces, Cheng Chao said, Have you heard of our terrible danger? I have heard nothing, said Chao Yu. Cao Cao and his hordes are encamped up the Han River. He has just sent letters asking our lord to hunt with him in Jiangxia. He may have a desire to absorb this country, but if so, the details of his designs are still secret. We prayed our master to give in his submission and so avoid the horrors of war. But now Lu Su has returned, bringing with him the directing instructions of Liu Pei's army, Chu Kalyang. Chu Kalyang, desiring to avenge himself for the recent defeat, has talked our lord into a mind for war and Lu Su persists in supporting that policy. They only await your final decision. Are you all unanimous in your opinion? We are perfectly unanimous, said Cheng Chao. Chao Yu said, The fact is, I have also desired to submit for a long time. I beg you to leave me now. And tomorrow we will see our master, and I shall make up his mind for him. So they took their leave. Very soon came the military party led by Chang Pu, Huang Kai, and Han Tang. They were admitted and duly inquired after their host's health. Then the leader Chang Pu said, Have you heard that our country is about to pass under another's government? No, I have heard nothing, replied the host. We helped General Sun Chuan to establish his authority here and carve out this kingdom. And to gain that end, we fought many a battle before we conquered the country. Now our Lord lends his ear to his civil officials and desire to submit himself to Cao Cao. This is most shameful and pitiful course and we would rather die than follow it, 
So we hope you will decide to fight and you may depend upon our struggling to the last person. And are you all unanimous generals? asked Chow Yu. Huang Kai suddenly started up and smote his forehead saying, They may take my head, but I swear never to surrender. Not one of us is willing to surrender, cried all the others. My desire also is to decide matters with Cao Cao on the battlefield. How could we think of submission? Now I will pray you retire, generals, and when I see our lord, I will settle his doubts. So the war party left. They were quickly succeeded by Chu Ka Chin, Lu Fan, and their faction. They were brought in. After the usual curtsies, Chu Ka Chin said, My brother has come down the river saying that Liu Pei desires to ally himself. Against Cao Cao. The civil and military hold different opinions as to the course to be pursued. But as my brother is so deeply concerned, I am unwilling to say much on either side. We are awaiting your decision. And what do you think about it? asked Chao Yu. Submission is an easy road to tranquility while the result of war is hard to foretell. Chao Yu smiled. I shall have my mind made up. Come tomorrow to the palace and the decision shall be announced. The trimmers took their leave, but soon after came Lu Meng, Tan Ning and their supporters, also desirous of discussing the same thing. And they told him that opinions differed greatly, some being for peace and other for war, one party constantly disputed with the other. I must not say much now, replied Chao Yu, but you will see tomorrow in the palace when the matter will be fully debated. They went away leaving Chao Yu smiling cynically. About event eat, Lu Su and Chu Kalyang came and Chao Yu went out to the main gate to receive them. When they had taken their proper seats, Lu Su spoke first, saying, Cao Cao has come against the south land with a huge army. Our master cannot decide whether to submit or give battle and wait for your decision. What is your decision? Chao Yu replied, We may not oppose Cao Cao when he acts as the command of the emperor. Moreover, he is very strong and to attack him is to take serious risks. In my opinion, opposition would mean defeat and since submission means peace, I have decided to advise our lord to write and offer surrender. But you are wrong, stammered Lu Su. This country has been under the same rule for three generations and cannot be suddenly abandoned to some other. Our late Lord Sun Tzu said that you were to be consulted on matters beyond the border and we depended upon you to keep the country as secure and solid as the Taishan mountains. Now you adopt the view of the weaklings and propose to yield? I cannot believe you mean it. Replied Chao Yu, the six territories contain countless people. If I am the means of bringing upon them the misery of war, they will hate me. So I have decided to advise submission. But do you not realize our Lord's might and the strength of our country? 
if Sao Sao does attack, it is very uncertain that he will realize his desire. The two wrangled for a time, for a long time, while Chu Kalyang sat smiling with folded arms. Presently, Chao Yu asked, Why do you smile thus, Master? And Chu Kalyang replied, I am smiling at no other than your opponent Lu Su, who knows nothing of the affairs of the day. Master, said Lu Su, what do you mean? Why this intention to submit is perfectly reasonable. It is the one proper thing. There, exclaimed Chao Yu, Chu Kalyang knows the times perfectly well, and he agrees with me. But both of you, why do you say this, said Lu Su. Said Chu Kalyam, Ka Sao Sao is an excellent commander, so good that no one dares oppose him. Only very few have ever attempted it, and they have been exterminated. The word knows them no more. The only exception is Liu Pei, who did not understand the condition and vigorously contended against him with the result that he is now at Jiangxia, in a very perilous state. To submit is to secure the safety of wives and children, to be rich and honored, but the dignity of the country would be left to chance and fate. However, this is not worth consideration. Lu Su interrupted angrily. Would you make our lord crook the knee to such a rebel as Sao Sao? Well, replied Chu Kalyang, there is another way and a cheaper. There would be no need to lead the sheep and shoulder wine pots for presents, nor any need to yield territory and surrender seals of office. It would not even be necessary to cross the river yourself. All you would require is a simple messenger and a little boat to ferry a couple of persons across the river. If Sao Sao only got these two under his hand, his hordes and legions would just drop their weapons, furl their banners and silently vanish away. What two persons could cause Sao Sao to go away, as you say? asked Zhao Yu. Two persons who could be easily spared from this populous country. They would not be missed any more than a leaf from a tree or a gain of millet from a granary. But if Sao Sao could only get them, would he not go away rejoicing? But who are the two? asked Zhao Yu again. When I was living in the country, they told me that Sao Sao was building a pavilion on the river Chang. It was to be named the Bronze Bird Tower. It is an exceedingly handsome building, and he has sought throughout all the world for the most beautiful woman to live in it, for Sao Sao really is a sensualist. Now there are two very famous beauties in Wu born of the Chiao family. So beautiful are they that birds alight and fishes drown. The moon hides her face and the flowers blush for shame at sight of them. Sao Sao has declared with an oath that he only wants two things in this world, the imperial throne in peace and the sight of these two women on bronze bird terraces. Given these two, he would go down to his grave without regret. This expedition of his huge army that threatens this country has for its real aim these two women. Why do you not buy these two from their father, the state patriarch Xiao? 
for any sum, however large, and send them over the river. The object of the army being attained, it will simply be marched away. This is the ruse that Fan Li of Yue made to the king of Wu, of the famous beauty Xi Shi. How do you know Cao Cao so greatly desires these two? said Zhao Yu. Because his son Cao Chi, who is an able writer at the command of his father, wrote a poem, an ode to the bronze bird terrace, theme only allowing allusions to the family fitness for the throne. He has sworn to possess these two women. I think I can remember the poem. If you wish to hear it, I admire it greatly. Try, said Chao Yu. So Chu Kalyang recited the poem. Let me follow in the footstep of the enlightened ruler that I may rejoice and ascend the storied terrace that I may gladden my heart that I may see the wide extent of the palace, that I may gaze upon the plains of the virtuous one. He has established the exalted gates high as the hills. He has built the lofty towers piercing the blue vault. He has set up beautiful buildings in the midst of heavens. Whence the eye can range over the cities of the west on the banks of the rolling river Chang, he planted it. Whence abundance of fruits could be looked for in this garden. The two towers rise, one on either flank. This named golden phoenix, that jade dragon, he would have the two. Chiaos, these beautiful ladies of Wu. that he might rejoice with them morning and evening. Look down, there is the grand beauty of an imperial city. And the rolling vapors lie, floating beneath. He will rejoice in the multitude of scholars that assemble. Answering to the felicious dreams of King Wan, look up and there is the gorgeous harmony of springtime. And the singing of many birds delight the ear, the lofty sky stands over all. The house desires success in its stout undertaking, that the human influence may be ported over all over the world. That the perfection of reverence may be offered to the ruler, only the richly prosperous rulers of King Wu and Huan could compare with that of the scared understanding, that fortune, what beauty, the gracious kindness spreads afar. The imperial family is supported, peace reigns over all empire bounded only by universe, bright as the glory of the sun and moon, even honorable and even enduring. The ruler shall live to the age of eastern emperor, the dragon banner shall wave to the farthest limit, his glorious chariot shall be guided with perfect wisdom, his thoughts shall reform all the world. Felicious produce shall be abundant and the people shall rest firm. My desire is that these towers shall endure forever, and that joy shall never cease through all ages. Chao Yu listened to the end, but then suddenly jumped up in a tremendous rage. Turning to the north and pointing with his finger, he cried, You old rebel, this insult is too deep. Chu Kalyang hastily rose too and soothed him, saying, But remember the Khan of the Xiangku people. The Han Emperor gave him a princess of the family to wife, although he had made many incursions into our territory. That was the prize of peace. You surely would not grudge two more women from among the common people. You do not know, sir, replied Chao Yu, of these two women of the Chiao family you mentioned. Elder Chiao is the widow of Sun Se, our late ruler, and younger Chiao is my wife. Chu Kalyang feigned the greatest astonishment and said, 
No, indeed, I did not know. I blundered. A deadly fault. A deadly fault. One of us two has to go. Either the old rebel or I. We shall not both live. I swear that, cried Chao Yu. However, such a matter needs a good deal of thought, replied Zhu Liang. We must not make any mistake. Chao Yu replied, I hold a sacred trust from my lord Sun Tzu. I would not bow the knee to any such as Sao Sao. What I said just now was to see how you stood. I left Poyang Lake with the intention of attacking the north and nothing can change that intention, not even the sword at my breast or the axe on my neck. But I trust you will lend an arm, and we will smite Sao Sao together. Should I be happy enough not to be rejected, I would render such humble service as I could. Perhaps presently I might be able to offer a plan to oppose him. I am going to see my lord tomorrow to discuss this matter, said Chao Yu. Chu Kalyang and Lu Su then left. Next day at dawn, Sun Chuan went to the council chamber where his officials, civil and military, were already assembled. They numbered about 60 in all. The civil with Chang Chao at their head were on the right. The military with Chang Pu as their leader were ranged on the left. All were in full ceremonial dress and the swords of the soldiers clanged on the pavement. Soon Chao Yu entered. When Sun Chuan had finished the usual gracious remarks, Chao Yu said, I hear that Cao Cao is encamped on the river and sent a dispatch to you, my lord. I would like to ask what your opinion is. Thereupon the dispatch was produced and handed to Chao Yu. After reading it through, he said, smiling, the old thief thinks there are no people in this land that he writes in this contemptuous strain. What do you think, sir? asked Sun Chuan. Have you discussed this with the officials? asked Zhao Yu. We have been discussing this for days. Some counsel surrender and some advise fight. I am undecided and therefore I have asked you to come and decide the point. Who advised surrender? asked Chao Yu. Chang Chao and his party are firmly set in this opinion. Chao Yu then turned to Chang Chao and said, I should be pleased to hear why you are for surrender. Then Chang Chao replied, Sao Sao has been attacking all opponents in the name of Emperor who is entirely in his hand. He does everything in the name of the government. Lately he has taken Ching Chou and thereby increased his prestige. Our defense against him was the great river, but now he also has a large fleet and can attack by water. How can we withstand him? Wherefore I counsel submission till some chance shall offer. This is but the opinion of an ill-advised student, said Chao Yu. How can you think of abandoning this country that we have held for three generations? That being so, said Sun Chuan, where is a plan to come from? Though Cao Cao assumes the name of Prime Minister of the Empire, he is at heart a rebel. You, O General, are able in war and brave. You are the hire to a father and brother. You command brave and tried soldiers, and you have plentiful supplies. You are able to overrun the whole country and rid it of every evil. There is no reason why you should surrender to a rebel. Moreover, Cao Cao has undertaken this expedition in defiance of all the rules of war. The north is unsubdued. Ma Tung and Han Sui threatens his rear. 
and yet he persists in his southern march. This is the first point against Cao Cao. The northern soldiers are unused to fighting on the water. Cao Cao is relinquishing his well-tried cavalry and tr trusting to ships. This is the second point against him. Again, we are now in full winter and the weather is at its coldest. So there is no food for the horses. That is the third point against him. Soldiers from the central state marching in a wet country among lakes and rivers will find themselves in an unaccustomed climate and suffer from malaria. That is the fourth point against him. Now when Cao Cao's armies have all these points against them, defeat is certain. However numerous they may be and you can take Cao Cao captive just as soon as you wish. Give me a few legions of veterans and I will go and destroy him. Sun Chuan started up from his place saying, The rebellious old rascal has been wanting to overthrow the Huns and set up himself for years. He has rid himself of all those he feared. Save only myself and I swear that one of us two shall go now. Both of us cannot live. What you say, noble friend, is just what I think, and heaven has certainly sent you to my assistance. The servant will fight a decisive battle, said Zhao Yu, and shrink not from any sacrifice, only general do not hesitate. Sun Chuan drew the sword that hung at his side and slashed off a corner of the table in front of him, exclaiming, let any person mention surrender and he shall be served as I have served this table. Then he handed the sword to Chao Yu, at the same time giving him a commission as commander-in-chief and Supreme Admiral Chang Pu being vice admiral. Lu Su was also nominated as assistant commander. In conclusion, Sun Chuan said, With this sword you will slay any officer who may disobey your commands. Chao Yu took the sword and turning to the assembly said, You have heard our Lord's charge to me, to lead you to destroy Cao Cao. You will all assemble tomorrow at the riverside camp to receive my orders. Should any be late or fail, then the full rigor of military law the seven prohibitions and the fifty-four capital penalties there provided will be enforced. Chao Yu took leave of Sun Chuan and left the chamber. The various officers also went their several ways. When Chao Yu reached his own place, he sent for Chu Kaliang to consult over the business in hand. He told Chu Kaliang of the decision that has been taken and asked for a plan of campaign. But your master has not yet made up his mind, said Chu Kaliang. Till he has, no plan can be decided upon. What do you mean? In his heart, Sun Chuan is still fearful of Cao Cao's numbers and frets over the inequality of the two armies. You will have to explain away those numbers and bring him to a final decision before anything can be effected. What you say is excellent, said Chao Yu, and he went to the palace that night to see his master. Sun Chuan said, You must have something of real importance to say if you come like this at night. Chao Yu said, I am making my dispositions tomorrow. You have quite made up your mind. The fact is, said Sun Chuan, I still feel nervous about the disparity of numbers. Surely we are too few. That is really all I feel doubtful about. It is precisely because you have this one remaining doubt that I am came, and I will explain. Sao Sao's letters speak of a million of marines and so you feel doubts and fears and do not wait to consider the real truth. Let us examine the case thoroughly. 
we find that he has of central region soldiers, say some 150,000 troops, and many of them are sick. He only got 70 or 80,000 northern soldiers from Yuan Shao, and many of those are of doubtful loyalty. Now these sick men and these men of doubtful loyalty seemed a great many, but they are not at all fearsome. I could smash them with 50,000 soldiers. You, my lord, have no further anxiety. Sun Chuan patted his general on the back, saying, You have explained my difficulty and received my doubts. Chang Chao is a fool who constantly bars my expedition. Only you and Lu Su have any real understanding of my heart. Tomorrow, you and Lu Su and Chang Fu will start and I shall have a strong reserve ready with plentiful supplies to support you. If difficulties arise, you can at once send for me and I will engage with my own army. Chao Yu left, but in his innermost heart he said to himself, If that Chu Kalyan can gauge my master's thoughts so very accurately, he is too clever for me and will be a danger. He will have to be put out of the way. Chao Yu sent a messenger over to Lu Su to talk over this last scheme. When he had let it bear, Lu Su did not favor it. No, no, said Lu Su, it is self-destruction to make away with your ablest officer before Cao Cao shall have been defeated. But Chu Kalyang will certainly help Liu Pei to our disadvantage. Try what his brother Chu Kachin can do to persuade him. It would be excellent thing to have those two in our service. Yes, indeed, replied Chao Yu. Next morning at dawn, Chao Yu went to his camp and took his seat in the council tent. The armed guards took up their stations right and left and the officers ranged themselves in lines to listen to the orders. Now Chang Pu was an older than Chao Yu but was made second in command, was very angry at being passed over. So he made a pretense of indisposition and stayed away from this assembly. But he sent his eldest son, Chang Zhe, to represent him. Chao Yu addressed the gathering, saying, The law knows no partiality, and you will all have to attend to your several duties. Cao Cao is now more absolute than ever was Tong Zhuo, and the emperor is really a prisoner in Shu Chang. Guarded by the most cruel soldiers, we have a command to destroy Cao Cao, and with your willing help, we shall advance. The army must cause no hardship to the people anywhere. The rewards for good service and punishments for faults shall be given impartially. Having delivered this charge, Chao Yu told off Han Tang and Huang Kui as leader of the Wan and ordered the ships under their own command to get underway and go to the three gorges. They would get orders by and by. Then he appointed four armies with two leaders over each. The first body was under Chiang Chin and Zhao Tai. The second, Pan Cheng and Ling Tong. The third, Tai Shi Qi and Lu Meng. The fourth, Lu Shun and Tong Shi. Lu Fan and Chu Zhe were appointed inspectors to move from place to place and keep the various units up to their work and acting with due regards to the general plan. Land and marine forces were to move simultaneously. The expedition would soon start. Having received their orders, each returned to his command and busied himself in preparation. Chang Zhe, the son of Chang Pu, returned and told his father what arrangements had been made. And Chang Pu was amazed at Chao Yu's skill. Said he, I have always despised Chao Yu as a mere student, who would never be a general. But this shows that he has a leader's talent. 
I must support him. So Chang Fu went over to the quarters of Commander in Chief and confessed his fault. He was received kindly, and all was over. Next, Chao Yu sent for Chu Kachen and said to him, "Evidently, your brother is a genius, a man born to be a king's counselor. Why then does he serve Liu Pei? Now that he is here, I wish you to use every effort to persuade him to stay with us." Thus, our lord would gain able support, and you two brothers would be together, which would be pleasant for you both. I wish you success. Chu Kachin replied, "I am ashamed of the little service I have rendered since I came here, and I can do no other than obey your command to the best of my ability." Thereupon, he went away to his brother, whom he found in the guest house. The younger brother received him, and when he had reached the inner rooms, Chu Kaliang bowed respectfully and weeping, told his experiences since they parted, and his sorrow at their separation. Then Chu Kachin, weeping, also said, "Brother, do you remember the story of Po Yi and Chu Qi, the brothers who would not be separated?" Ah, Chao Yu has sent him to talk me over. Thought Chu Kaliang. So he replied, "They were two of the noble people of old days. Yes, I know. Those two, although they perished of hunger near the Shaoyang Hills, yet never separated. You and I, born of the same mother, yet serve different masters and never meet. Are you not ashamed when you think of such examples?" As Po Yi and Shu Qi, Chu Kaliang replied, "You are talking now of love, but what I stand for is duty. We are both men of Han, and Liu Pei is of the family. If you, brother, could leave the Southland and join me in serving the rightful branch." Then, on the one side, we should be honored as ministers of Han, and on the other, we should be together as people of same flesh and blood should be. Thus, love and duty would both receive their proper need. What do you think of it, my brother? I came to persuade him, and lo, it is I who is being talked over. Thought Chu Kachin. He had no fitting reply to make, so he rose and took his leave. Returning to Chao Ye, he related the story of the interview. What do you think? Asked Chao Yu. General Sun Chuan has treated me with great kindness, and I could not turn my back on him. Replied Chu Kachin. Since you decide to remain loyal, there is no need to say much. I think I have a plan to win over your brother. The wisest people see eye to eye, for each but sees the right. But should their several interests clash, they all the fiercer fight. The means by which Chao Yu tried to get the support of Chu Kaliang will be described in the next chapter.